Good morning. I want to thank you for not having the children sing immediately before me. You just can't follow that. That was too precious. My goodness, I, I was loving that. And then there was that young man, front row on the, on the right, and uh, I think he was pretty cool because we both have blue shoes on. We both have tan pants. We both have a blue button-down shirt. But where he takes it to the next level is his hair is way cooler than mine. And I just, I'm going to have to go home and see if I can work that out. Oh, praise God. I truly thank you. My name is uh, David Decker. I truly thank you so much for allowing me to be with you once again. I was here uh, a few months ago over the summer. And uh, I was truly so excited to come back because I, I say this and I, and I mean this. This isn't just a, uh, you know, some guy trying to be nice. I truly mean this and truly appreciate this, that you are so kind. Coming to this church, I feel so welcomed and so loved. And I just, I appreciate that. You are so kind. I walk in the front door and there's like six people, seven people there to greet me. I felt like a, you know, like a, a movie star coming in and, and shaking everyone's hand. It was just absolutely wonderful. I just, I thank you so much for your kindness. I thank you for trusting me with your pulpit for the next few moments. Um, and let's just, would you please just uh, join me? Let's pray and ask God to bless this time. Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you that the sun is shining outside, but uh, Lord, on the inside, the S-O-N, the sun is shining, and how I praise you for that. I ask that your blessing would be upon this service, that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. As I go through these verses, Lord, it is unbelievably humbling Lord, but, uh, but I pray that your message would go forth with uh, passion, with power, and uh, that your words would change lives this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. If you, and I'm sure many of you are, if you're anything like me, you try to be uh, the, the glass is half full guy. You try to have a positive outlook on things. You try to be happy in all the circumstances as, as, as Scripture in, instructs us to, to, to find joy in all circumstances, uh, to, be, to be thankful, to be joyful in all circumstances. Not thankful and joyful for all circumstances, but to be thankful and joyful in all circumstances. And that is great when we're sitting in church. It is nice and to sit with our church family, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and, and to say, yes, I am thankful for this moment. But then we walk outside. Then we go about our week. Then we turn on the news. Then we, we see what's going on. And it makes it a little more difficult and as we go through today's message, I ask and, and I pray that you would allow God to speak to you. And these, these verses have been very challenging to me and very humbling to me as, as I've prepared for this message this morning. And it's entitled, God is love, but. God is love, but. Now, the first time, just to share a quick story, the first time I ever preached in front of a church, first time ever, all I remember about it is I said in the message, God gave me a big butt. And see, you're, see, you're so kind because the church I was at laughed so much harder than you did. And I was talking how I had one plan, but God, 
he had another plan. And everyone's laughing. And I turned, the pastor was sitting up here on this on the 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 uh, pole or behind the pulpit with me and I I turned and looked at him and he's laughing too and he says you're on your own buddy and and uh, that was that was how we got things started but today the title of the message God is love but now I do not know a Christian who would argue with that statement God is love in fact it tells us in Scripture. God is love. But there's so much more. And that's a little bit of what I want to share with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn and follow along in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'll, I'll read along. I happen to be reading from the, the, the Christian Standard Bible. Um. And we're going we're gonna to take a look at this, that God is love, but... Now, believe it or not, it says the word love throughout Scripture hundreds and hundreds of times. The word love hundreds of times. And when you look at the original meaning, the, the Hebrew and the Greek, they didn't just have love, like we love our wives and we love tacos and we love cars and we they they had different words of love for for different things more and more appropriate you know because it's hard for us to put you know uh food and uh, our spouse and uh, under the same word of 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 love and when we look but the word love hundreds of times throughout scripture and it is used exactly twice to say God is love. Now, we talk about God's love all the time. And that's, that's where it, it comes natural for me to look for the, the good, is I love to talk about God's love. I love to focus on how He is love. I love to, to, to just focus on how He loves me. Sometimes I don't love the other things. And that's a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. And as we dive into Scripture, I want you to know that, that uh, well, first of all, I, I've, I've been praying for you as a, as a, as a church body. And I, I see that next Sunday is a, is a very big day for you. And, I, and I'm going to be praying this week uh, for God's will to be done, be praying for that young man and his family and praying for you for guidance and wisdom. And, but one, one thing caught me is that uh, his, his wife um, is a pastor's kid. Now, you've got to watch out for those pastor's kids. Okay? You, you, you do. Because they have a reputation of causing trouble. And I want you to know, though, it is true because the pastor's kids hang out with the deacon's kids. And that's why they cause trouble, okay? Just, just throwing that out there. But in all seriousness, I will be praying for you, praying that God's will be done. What an a, a exciting thing that uh, God has uh, planned for your church, and it's, it's just wonderful. Now, let's look in God's Word, Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to go down and read, if you'll allow me, just read through the chapter. It's a short chapter. And then, we'll, then we're going to hit a couple key things here. And it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices. And the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and his, in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who will I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. And he replied, Go. Say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their minds. Turn back and be healed. Then I said, Unto, Until when, Lord? And he replied, Until cities lie in ruins without inhabitants. Houses are without people. The land is ruined and desolate. And the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again. Like the terebinth or the oak, the leaves a stump when felled, the holy seed is the stump. Now we start off the beginning of this chapter. We actually start off with, uh, with Isaiah talking about a funeral. And he's saying, in the year that King Uzziah died... Now, that would have been approximately 740 B.C. History, uh, not only inside Scripture, but, but outer sources outside of Scripture, uh, tell us that there was this king, there was this king Uzziah. He was a, a, a good king, history tells us, Scripture tells us, that, that, that God blessed him. And he died approximately the year 740 B.C. So that's where Isaiah starts us off there and he does that to show us exactly what time period he's talking about he gives us that so we can narrow it down and i love in this verse i saw the lord seated on a high and lofty throne and the hem of his robe filled the temple now at this time royalty would have a a, a train to their, 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 their clothing, their robe. And when they would enter the throne room, they would, have, they would have servants carrying the train for them. A lot like we, we would see in, in, in weddings in our culture today, that oftentimes brides have a train and the, the bridesmaids, are, are, they, they help carry it around, especially when she moves on the stage during various parts of the wedding ceremony, the bridesmaids will, will fix her train there and, and, and make it look all, all beautiful for her. And, and the longer the train was for royalty in this time, in this culture, uh, the, the, the higher they were, okay? And, and it says here, now, now I love, you can't outdo God. You just, you, you can't. And because his train, it says that the hem of his robe filled the temple. So it just wasn't a little bit of, you know, tuxedo tails going on here. That that his hem actually filled the temple. That he is, was, and always will be the ultimate royalty. Okay? And, and that verse shows us. And, and uh, now we continue. Verse 2. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. That is hard for me to, to picture. To wrap my mind around. Now, Isaiah does a wonderful job explaining it, but, but, but I've never seen anything like that to, to fully comprehend, to fully understand. Now, that six wings, 
Two, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. And, and we, we, we believe, we, we know that you, you humble yourself before royalty. And, and these, these seraphim, they're, they're, they're not worthy. They're covering their faces. They're covering their feet as they're in the throne room of the holy God. And, and what I find so interesting is that these angelic creatures, their name, seraphim, actually means burning one. Burning ones. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Now, verse 3. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. Holy, holy, holy. This, the, these three words are also used in Revelation. Holy, holy, holy. Have you ever heard when you were a young child, did you ever hear this song that never ends? This is the song that never ends. Don't worry, I, that's where I'll stop. Okay. Some of you are already upset with me because that song's going to be stuck in your head now. But when, when we were children, we'd sing that song and we'd just keep going on and on and on. Well, this truly in the throne room of God is the song that never ends. What we see in Isaiah, what we see in the book of Revelation is that they are continuously singing. It says they're calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. Or in Revelation, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. Now we mentioned that God is love. And it says that exact term two times in Scripture, both in 1 John, God is love. Now it says directly in Scripture, that God is holy over 400 times. And yet we focus on God as love when it says that two times. But it tells us that God is holy hundreds and hundreds of times. And I believe you and I, if Scripture has that kind of balance that it tells us, focuses on the holiness of God hundreds of times compared to God is love two times. I believe you and I, we should have a little more focus on God's holiness. That our God is holy, holy, holy. Holy meaning set apart. There is nobody like Him. Holy, holy, holy. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. There is nobody like Him. You and I, we focus on God's love. And don't stop thinking for one second that God is not love. But I believe we need to spend a little more time recognizing God's holiness. And when we come to the throne room, we must understand and acknowledge that our God is holy. Holy, holy. When we come before the Lord, whether it be here as a congregation or in our prayer closet, when we come before the Lord, we must recognize, we must honor, we must remember that God is holy, holy, holy. God is love. But don't forget, God is holy. 
And then we continue, verse 4. The foundations of the doorways shook, and the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. foundations of the doorway shook. To shake a foundation, it has to be something pretty serious. A strong foundation is not easily shaken. The sound of their voices, the foundations of the doorway shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Now, it was probably incense. But I can't help to think that the name seraphim means burning ones when it talks about that, that it was filled with smoke. That these burning ones, these, these seraphim are flying around, humbling themselves before the Lord, covering their faces, covering their feet, but just continuing to cry out, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah uh, 6, 5. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies, Isaiah understands here what's going on. And he's saying, wait a minute. This place is holy. My God is holy. The seraphim are crying out, holy. And they're doing it in such a mighty way that it's shaking the foundation of the doors. And like I said, we don't approach the throne room without being humble. We don't approach our God without humbling ourselves. You walk, if, if it were possible, take a, a little Im- imaginative trip with me for just a moment. If it were possible to to just walk into the throne room of God right now. I promise you, you and I, I don't care what your name is. I don't care who you know. I don't care what your title is or what initials are after your name. You are not going to walk into God's throne room pridefully you are going to have a very similar situation as isaiah here and a a similar reaction that you're going to understand wait a minute woe is me for i am ruined it says isaiah understands this my god is holy 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 i am a man of unclean lips He's saying, God is perfect, I am a sinner. And because I am here, I am am ruined. I am going to die, I'm not worthy to be here. And I believe that's the attitude you and I need when we approach our Lord. That we understand, we are men women of unclean lips. We live among a people of unclean lips. In the presence, you and I and everyone will understand our sinfulness. In the presence of God, we will understand how unworthy we really and truly are. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips. Your iniquity 
is removed and your sin is atoned for. Fire can purify. Fire can destroy. Fire can also purify. And this burning coal was taken from the altar where sacrifices were offered to atone for sin. And they're preparing Isaiah's lips for the task that was before him, that was about to be placed before him. And by this burning coal, his lips were purified. They were prepared to be sharing the message that God is going to give him. Humble yourself before the Lord. Allow him to purify you and to prepare you to share the message that God has for you. And you and I, every single one of us, again, doesn't matter what our title is or what initials are after our name. Every single one of us, we have a purpose. We have a purpose. We are no accident. We are no cosmic bang that created us. This is, this is going to be flattering, but I... I say this in the mirror also, but you and I, we're just dirt. What Genesis tells us, God formed man out of the dust on the ground. We're just dirt. We're nobody on our own. But when God breathes life into us, like he breathed life into Adam's nostrils, when God breathes life into us, and every single one of us have that breath of life in us right now, and you know how I know? Because you're here. You and I have that breath of life in us. God's very breath. We don't think about taking that next breath because God gives it to us. And nowhere in this holy word is it promised to us. But that breath I just took was a gift from God. And if he allows me to have that next breath and the next breath and the next breath, he is telling you and I, I am not done with you. I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. I have a mission for you. I am preparing you to share the message of my son, Jesus Christ, with a world that desperately needs it. And my goodness, our world desperately needs that message. Verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. As a teacher, you love it when the kids just, they raise their hand. I, I love it. And, and now I deal, in my school, I deal with mostly the, the high school students in, in most of my teaching. But my goodness, I love every once in a while. I get to work with the younger kids. And when they know an answer, oh my goodness, they just, that hand shoots up. There is excitement there. They are wiggling in their chair. They get their arm going. They're about to, to flap and fly away it's because they know the answer or they want to do the task that is set before them I want to be like that like Isaiah before my God God says 
Whom shall I send? Who will I send? Who will go for us? Now notice that for us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. I want to be that person. God hasn't even given him his marching orders yet. And he's saying, here I am, send me. He has no idea what God's about to tell him, but he says, here I am, send me. I want to be more like Isaiah there. And I want to cry out to God, here I am, send me. Every morning, here I am, send me. I don't know what the day's about to bring, but I know my God is going to walk through every step with me. And I want to go for him. And I want to share that message. Who will go for us? Continuing in verse 9. Go. Say to these people. Now, watch and listen carefully what is said in these next couple verses. What God says to Isaiah. So let me begin again at the beginning of verse 9. And he replied, Go, say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their minds. Turn back and be healed. Isaiah is sent to the people of Israel. And with him sharing the truth, the hardness of, of the heart is brought to light. And God's not only telling him what to say, he's preparing him for what he's going to see and what he's going to experience. We are going to tell the world about Jesus Christ. And when we do, Praise God, some of them will repent and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But when that is done, some of them, it's going to bring to light their hardened hearts, their blind eyes, their deaf ears. Everyone that we share Jesus with is not going to, to receive that message. And many won't receive it kindly. And we said God is love. And I believe the the Holy Bible is is a love letter for us. Telling us, every single thing that we must know to get from where we are to where he wants us to be. It covers all the bases that we need to get from where we are to where God wants us to be. And in this love letter, he's crying out, I love you. And it says that God is love. We've already touched on that. In fact, his love is so great that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die on a cross in my place, to pay my debt, a debt that in millions of years I could never repay. And people, for all these years, 
when God reaches out and says, I love you this much. In fact, Jesus said, I love you this much on the cross. But when God shares that love, so many doors have been slammed in his face. And we see it when Jesus walked this earth. He's sharing the perfect man, fully man, fully God, the perfect man sharing the perfect message with God's love in the perfect way. And people were still rejecting it right and left. You and I are going to experience that rejection when we share God's message. And God's telling Isaiah, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is what you're going to say. This is what you're going to experience. When we preach God's word, we see these things happen. When we share God's love, we experience these things. The good, the bad, the ugly, if you will. And only God, only God can change a heart. Paul tells us that some will plant, some will water, but it's God that makes it grow. Some will preach, some will teach. All of us have the gift of the Spirit at our disposal that the precious children sung about for us this morning. But it's only God, only God, that can soften that heart, that can make the blind to see, the deaf to hear. Only God. Read these last few verses here. Verse 11. Then I said, Until when, Lord? And he replied, Until cities lie in ruins without inhabitants. Houses are without people. The land is ruined and desolate. And the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again like the terebinth or the oak that leaves a stump when felled. The holy seed is the stump. Everyone that shared, has shared God's word from this pulpit, God's word has gone forth. And some... Some of the men that have stood up here, they'll, they'll share the message with, with great eloquence, using amazing words. I can't speak the big fancy words if you can't tell. But some have done that. Some will do that. Some will share it in a way that to you it just, that's it. I now I see God's word. God opened your eyes to see what those verses are saying. Maybe you've read over those verses hundreds of times. But God will use that one time to open your eyes, to open your ears. God willing, the pastor that's speaking next week, that if it is his will, will be your pastor. And I emphasize God's will, of course. But if it is God's will and that, that man and his family become part of your family and he's preaching God's word, there will be times where he will preach a word, read a verse, and all of a sudden it's going to click. There it is. There it is. And it's not because that, that, that he is a mighty man of God or he's spent 20 years just, just studying and praying in God's word. It's because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes. 
opened your ears, softened your heart. And through God, you now you see it. Now you understand it. Now you have a responsibility to do something with it. And Isaiah asked, God, okay, this is what, you're telling me to preach your word even though they're not going to understand it. They're not going to receive it. How long am I supposed to do this? I don't, I, 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 scripture doesn't say it, but maybe Isaiah was a little like, maybe I shouldn't have raised my hand so fast and said, send me, Lord. Because now I see it's not going to be all fun and games. He says, how long am I supposed to do it? And if I were to sum it up in my own words, I would say, until there's nobody left. That's how long you and I are to do the will of God, to work the work that God has placed before us. As long as you and I are on this earth, as long as there is somebody that needs to hear the truth of God, we are to say it. We are to preach it. We are to live it out. And my goodness, let your words match your actions. Or may the, the talk match the walk. Say the words that Jesus places on your lips and live them out in your life. Our world, I say this with love, and I say this as a very broad statement, but our world is the way our world is because the church has not been what the church is to be. You can say what you want about our government, but we would not need the government programs if the church did what the church is supposed to be. We would not need all these programs if the church was the church. And what do I mean by the church? I mean, look at Acts. If you were to read Acts without knowing nothing about the, the American church or the, even the church around the world, without knowing nothing about it, and then you were to walk into a church today, would our church match up to what the church is in God's Word? That may sound harsh or hard, but let me step back and say, I think you're on to something. I think you're on to something. This church, Abundant Life Baptist Church, praise God for it. You are in a, this building, this, this building of course is not the church, you are the church, but this building is in such a fantastic place for ministry. You have one of the most precious mission fields right there across the street. You are in a, a, a very busy location. And when I say you're on, on to something, what I'm talking about is your kindness and your love that you have shown me when I've walked in these doors these couple times. I truly appreciate that, and that truly excites me. Because when a stranger walks in off the street and you make them feel loved like that, you make them feel welcomed, you, you put out the carpet and say, come as you are, we're just glad you're here, you're doing God's will. You're doing exactly what God has called you to do, exactly what God has called the church to do. Now, let's not get caught up that all the ministry happens up here or in this room or in this building because we're sent out. But I'm telling you, you're on to something. And I know there's, it's so much deeper than that. But what a beautiful place to start. I know your church does so much more than that. You do so much more than just welcome with a smile. But what a beautiful place to start. 
we look through this scripture today. And I challenge you to not only focus on the love of God. And know that God is love. But know that you are serving, loving, working for, if I could put it that way, approaching, spending time with a God that is holy, holy, holy. Precious Heavenly Father, how I thank you for these few moments to share your holy word. How I thank you for the work you are doing in this body of believers. And I join them in praying, praying for this, this young man and his family that is a candidate for, to be the pastor here. Lord, I pray that you would give this congregation, this body, peace on the decision that they make. Guidance on how to make that decision. And wisdom, your wisdom, to make the right decision. And I pray the, the same for the, the pastor and his family. Because, Lord, I am excited to see the work you have and what you're going to do, how you are going to change the world through abundant life. And as we spent these few moments in your word today, I pray that we would remember you are a holy, holy, holy God. May we approach you in great humility. But I also pray that as we approach you, that we would have a little bit of Isaiah in us and we would raise our hand saying, Here I am, send me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen.